Hi everybody, Ed Stetzer here, and so thrilled to be able to open up our uh, presentations. I wish I could be there in person. I'm actually teaching this fall at Oxford University, uh, living in the UK, uh, and actually recording from my flat here. And so uh, I wanted to start maybe in a strange place. Uh, the conferences like this are rightfully looking forward, but part of what I'm doing is I'm on my sabbatical, so I'm teaching here this fall, but I'm actually writing a couple of books, one on the future of evangelicalism, but the other is on really the shift that happened in many churches in the early part of the, uh, you know, the early part of the 90s and into 2000. And one of the, we're talking about different innovations. But as a missiologist, my research is looking at what some of the shifts were that took place. And I'm going to share with you some of those here today. Let's talk some about the movement itself and, and how we got there and the journey that it involved. So when it comes to a movement, uh, the multi-ethnic movement, there's phases that things go through. There's a foundation of the a movement, and then there's ultimately a diffusion of some of its values. And then from there, we're going to look at the future. So let's start by talking about some about the foundation. Starting in the late 60s, um, the theological conversations about racial reconciliation began to be developed by evangelical leaders, uh, some in the civil rights movement, like John Perkins, Samuel Hines, Tom Skinner, and others. And these leaders put forth some ideas that in order to receive reconciliation, some things needed to happen. Uh, individuals of different races must um, develop relationships with each other. Uh, recognizing social structures of inequality, Christians have to resist them together. Third, that and quoting whites as the main creators and benefactors of racialized society, must repent of their personal, historic, and social sins. Uh, fourth, um, in this case, talking about African-Americans, must be willing when whites ask to forgive them individually and corporately. Some of these things sort of emerged in the conversation in the 60s, but by the time we get to the 1990s, some of those conversations begin to become more evident. And one of the first places and times when we think about some of these things is actually uh, in and around things like, well, promise keepers. Um, and Bill McCartney, the organization leader, made the statement that, quote, racism is an insidious monster. You can't say you love God, and then not love your brother. Now, again, it was very focused on individual responses, but in evangelical faith and practice, this is one of the first times when we began to hear this broadly engaged. Billy Graham actually took a uh, stand and said, quote, racial and ethnic hostility is the foremost social problem facing our world today unquote. Now, now, don't misunderstand, the reaction was swift and significant and, and important to note that the reaction wasn't all, well, wasn't all positive. Uh, Tony Evans, a megachurch pastor in Dallas, summarized and said, the concerns of Black Americans are not of dominant concern by and large to white evangelicals. But what happens then around this time too is the growth and emergence of sociological studies on uh, multiracial Christian congregations. It's a relatively new idea. And, um, and the, not a lot of publications in the 80s. So 1996, Promise Keepers, um, 2000, Divided by Faith, Michael Emerson and Christian Smith. And then 2004, we see United by Faith, Young, Emerson, Yancey, and Kim. And so people are beginning to talk about some of these things. And I, I would say, I'll see you in just a minute, that that marks the end of the forerunner stage and the beginning of the pioneer stage of the multi-ethnic church movement. At this time, 7.5% uh, of churches across the country have at least 20% diversity in their attending membership. So 1996, Promise Keepers, 2000, Divided by Faith, 2004, United by Faith, and then in 2004, the first multi-ethnic church conference, 30 people in attendance, 30 people in attendance. 2005, this is on the cover of Christianity Today, all churches should be multiracial. Uh, George and Mark speak at the uh, Ethnic America Conference in Dallas. And again, in November, Mosaics hosts a second local conference in Dallas, about 100 people attend here. But then things clearly begin to change. There's, there's what I'm calling um, institutional and organizational breakthrough. So now we're having multiracial and multi-ethnic tracks and large conferences like the National New Church Conference, now called the Exponential Conference, the Purpose Driven Network, that's 2008, the Willow Creek Leadership Summit from Smith and others. Uh, people begin to create uh, new departments, uh, uh, positions for advancement of multi-ethnic churches. 
uh, the Evangelical Covenant Church does, the Evangelical Free Church in America does, the Reformed Church in America does. Uh, Leadership Network is now invested in some of the multi-ethnic church as one of their feature church uh, innovations. Uh, Building a healthy multi-ethnic church is a key part of laying some of that foundation. 2010, the first Mosaics National Multi-Ethnic Church Conference and mainstream these sessions around live streamed over the internet. Uh, People engage uh, all over the, the world and the theme is on earth as it is in heaven. So uh, Mark's column, actually the Ethnic Blends Vision begins at Outreach Magazine. So, so again, some of these conversations are advancing and then we talk about that diffusion, right? If we go from the pioneer stage, the, the forerunner stage, we get to the pioneer stage. And I think we need to see the work of mosaics um, in, in the context of uh, this kind of pioneer stage, each gathering, each conference, each book have all been part of piercing, piecing together the contours of a multi-ethnic movement. Now, now again, we would all acknowledge it's more than the people gathered in the room in Dallas, but you can't miss seeing the development that's here. We now have a firmer grasp of the sociological factors of the movement uh, on religion and race. We have a clear understanding of the theology of race, and more importantly, of its relationship to um, to ultimately the work of Christ. The Ephesians passages point us to that. Ultimately, to ecclesiology, race, and ethnicity are far better understood now as as biblical. Um, ethnicity is a biblical value and rooted in Scripture, but also in the history of the church. We can articulate values and principles that underline multi ethnic ministries. These all were things that weren't articulated well in late nineteen nineties. Uh, again, we had things to learn. We, had, we could learn from history. We could learn from the scripture. We could learn from uh, from the new early church and more. But a decade ago, the conversation would be very different. So this this work that Mosaics has been doing, uh, it's hard, slow, and sometimes contentious, but good, critical, and worthy foundation for the next generation. So, so, so again, these, these conferences uh, continue. Uh, we know 2013 in Long Beach, 2016, um, I had the privilege of, of sharing there in 2016 as well, and uh, and, and 2019. You see the three-year pattern um, of the conferences, and and here we come uh, now, ultimately to well, where 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 we are, where we are today. The road now for the past over a decade has been hard, slow, sometimes contentious. So, what's the future? Well, that's what people are going to talk about. But let's let's not be naive to think that there are not challenges. Cultural polarization is a growing reality and obstacle. Some of these things that even five years ago, people would say, this sounds great, now are being questioned by people uh, in the evangelical tradition and beyond. We've got to We've got to speak into that moment. Resurgent ethnic nationalism, this is a very real thing, and it's a real thing in the church. And to some degree, generational exhaustion. People are, I just recently interviewed Albert Tate about talking about staying at the table, staying in these conversations. But but we also see the results from, uh, you know, recently the Baylor study co-authored by Michael Emerson in 2020, the increases in 1998 to 2019, uh, 10% of mainline Protestant churches now multiracial up from 1%, 22% of evangelical up from 7%, 16% of Pentecostal up from 3%, uh, Catholic churches 23% up from 17%. Um, and 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 again, we see we see these growing opportunities and realities, and it actually represents some of the fastest growing segments of evangelical Christianity today. But the obstacles are here. Um, the obstacles are still here. We live in a challenging and divided time, and yet uh, the moment we're in doesn't pause the mission we're on. There are there are opportunities before us to seize as well. There are opportunities to to move forward. Religious collaboration, right? A hallmark of the strength of most of the movements represented in that room are a willingness to collaborate on mission with like-minded Christians. Well, multi-ethnic ministry, which points us both to tied to eschatology and ecclesiology, so essential to the Christian mission, uh, we partner together. We actually, even at the Wheaton, uh, Wheaton College in our grad school, partner together with Mosaics, many others of you as well. Also a post-Christian missional disposition. We no longer have a home field. There's 
There's not a cultural Christianity to preserve. This is an opportunity for us to join Jesus on mission. And of course, when leaders like Damas and Yancey have been writing for decades, I'm encouraged the rise of other voices speaking into the future of multi-ethnic ministry as well. Let me show you some unreleased research that's coming, that will be forthcoming in the book I'm writing on the subject. And we can actually see we are very intentional about fostering a culturally and ethnically diverse congregation. So in a sense, the conversation has been advanced. But let me also say to you that it's a challenge and an encouragement. These are uncertain times. And as we walk through these days together, my encouragement to you is to not grow weary, to recognize that that when you're pioneering and you're stepping into a new space and a new movement, it's there are challenging times. Principles and principalities and powers will try to undermine and instill division. Resist fervently in prayer. The enemy sees so seeds of disunity by whatever it may be. Um, we, we we unite in new ways around the good news of the gospel in community with men and women from every tongue, tribe, and nation. And the world tries to marginalize or intentionally misunderstand what's going on. We can ultimately point them to the good news of the gospel that shows a better way. So my encouragement to you as we begin this gathering together, make much of Jesus. Let's learn from one another. The future ahead of us can be exceeding abundantly beyond all we might ask or think, reflective of that Revelation 7 vision, men and women from every tongue, tribe, and nation. Thanks for much for the opportunity to let me share with you.